Bill Wilson, Wilson Combat here again. Uh, this was my good friend, Ken Hackathorn. Uh, last time we visited, we were talking about um, 1911s. And uh, Ken, what features do you consider on the 1911 uh, to be absolute necessities? Well, Bill, I, I always split it into two categories. There's what we call needs and wants. Okay. And the needs are, I want sights I can see, I want a trigger that is breaks clean and is a weight that I can manage. And if you're actually to ask me to pick between the two, the trigger is more important than sights. I mean, I shot that old GI 1911A1 I bought a while back to Remick Moran and the sights are kind of a blur, but you know what, I still shot real well because it's, it had a good, nice, clean, crisp, probably five pound trigger. So a good trigger. Mm -hmm. Sights I can see. Everybody says, well, what's a good sight? And they change. When I was starting out shooting you, we all wanted black sights because we were shooting on tan silhouettes. Yeah, we wanted nice, narrow, oh, you know, tight lines, of, lines of light on either side of yeah. them. Now I need a bigger notch. And I need a front sight that shows up. I'm a big fan of gold beads. The fiber optics today are superb. Uh, if you carry the gun for self-defense, you may want to look at something like a tritium sight setup. But good trigger, good sights. And really from then on, you, I want a gun that's functionally reliable. That, absolutely, I've got a gun I have faith and confidence that will work with the ammo, I'm gonna feed it. Then from there, you kind of get into wants. For example, I want a gun that doesn't have sharp edges. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big changes in our time of the 1911, probably the single most important want I have now is that beaver tail grip safety. Yeah. Back in the day with the old GI types, remember how it ate your hands mm -hmm. up? I mean, we were all bruised and well, Especially people that had meaty hands. Yeah, so I consider the next thing I want is a beaver tail grip, mm -hmm. something that cushions the recoil. Um, I like to have a pistol that has something that's got some adhesion as far as checkering. People often ask me, well, you've got ivory stocks in your gun, aren't those slick? And you know what, they are. In the summertime when your hands are sweaty and slick, in the wintertime when your hands are cold and slick, but I compensate it by the checkering. And one of the things, the benefit to me is, well, what Larry Bickers and I were talking about, why do you use those? Well, one, I like them, they're cool. And number two, one of the problems I've had, Bill, and I know you've had it, is you're shooting a series of shots and you relax your grip. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, the next shot tends to go someplace where yeah. you don't want it to. These stocks, because they're slick, have forced me to grip the gun really hard, which works yeah. out real well. Um, I like some form of a magazine well that's easier to hit, whether it's beveled. And now with these add-on mag wells like this mag shoot you guys sell now, um, I, I jokingly say Ray Charles could hit that one. So I think that's real important. The, uh, I'm a fan of medium length triggers. Some guys like short, some like long, I like the medium. A extended thumb safety, what we call a speed safety, for me is a plus. I like strong side, I'm not a fan for ambi. If you're left-handed, you're gonna have to have an ambi, but I just never, because for me, my hand's so big, when I flip it off, the pedal on this side hits yeah. my finger. Um, on the other hand, you know, for years I used a standard stock thumb safety in 1911. You know what, I actually never had any problem using it. Well, especially the the GI ones that had the pad at the front like that. I mean, I mean, in reality, that's not a bad setup. No, it worked. Um, you know, one of the things that's nice on the pistols, and you certainly are one of the guys that helped pioneer, is the slight extended magazine catch. Now, I'm lucky I got a big hand. I don't have to move the pistol very far, but it, I think it's an asset. Uh, one of the things people say to me, well, do you need an accurized gun? If you can shoot the gun as well as you need to shoot it, it probably doesn't need to be accurized, but it's certainly a nice feature. Mm -hmm. uh, guy said, well, how accurate your gun? And I can say, well, you know, there was a time when I could see well that I could stand at 20, 25 yards and shoot a two and a half inch group at that distance. Vision-wise, I can't do it. So if I have a gun today that only shoots five inches, it's about as good as I can shoot. But I like the confidence, and I know this gun, for example, with any decent ammo, will shoot an inch and a half. I can't do it, but I know the gun can. Um, a lot of luxuries. I mean, I like the gun to deburred. I don't want a sharp edge or something that's going to mm -hmm. braid my clothing or whatever. Um, your sights you've got. Now, I'm a big fan, as you know. I was one of the guys that kind of championed the U notch mm -hmm. sight, and I like the gold bead front. And there's a big argument. Is a square notch better than a round? 
Remember, if the human eye is accustomed to looking at round objects. I always tell people, if the square notch sight is the way to go, every service rifle, when you pick up your M16 and M4, it should have a square sight. And it doesn't, because mm -hmm. the eye naturally centers on a circular object. So the U-notch, for me, picks up faster, particularly with a bead or a fiber optic. Um, I like a little wider notch at this point yeah. in my life, just like you. I need it to, to find it. I mean, there's a lot of refinements on a gun. Some people say, how about front grasping grooves? You know, if, if you press check your gun, the way you're going to check and see if they run, if you do this, or you're one of the guys that do this, they're an asset. You don't need them. I mean, I can grab the gun and do that and see if there's a round in the chamber. Um, one of the things I think now that's fantastic is we've now got protective finishes. Back when you and I started, you pretty much either had a blue or nickel gun. Yeah. Hard chrome was popular because it limited the wear to the gun and gave you some protection from the environment. But we both know hard chrome will rust if you don't oh, yeah. stay on top of it. So with the modern finishes like you've got now, um, these things are pretty impervious to um, the elements. And honestly, the one weak link we all, you and I both see, is people tend to be reluctant to lubricate their guns. Yeah. I'm a big fan of keeping your gun well lubricated, but even if you don't, this finish does provide a level of lubricity that previously we never had. So, I mean, the, the wonderful, uh, you know, the VZ G10 grips you guys offer are great. If you want a good, you know, grasp, good yeah. adhesive grip, man, they're superb. I think that the Starburst one you guys is really cool. As far as it doesn't abrade your clothing, but when you clamp the grip down, it works real well. Yeah, because a lot of meat can get in those big wide grooves. Yeah. So um, back in the day, Bill, you can remember we all had squared turret mm -hmm. arms. I still like the way they look. Yeah. I don't use them, but I think they're kind of cool looking. Um, but otherwise, my guns over the years have gotten more basic. Like for example, you guys serrate the top of the slide. I think it was really attractive. But the truth of the matter, it doesn't do much of anything, you know. But when you buy a gun like a Wilson Combat Pistol, it's a item of pride. It's a pro, you know, and it's something you want to show off. And I tell people, when you show your buddies a gun, you don't want to have to apologize for anything. Yeah. So, but I basically good trigger, sights I can see, beaver tail. I want a magwell now. Uh, I want some kind of a gripping surface that's somewhat adhesive. And now I really like the these, if you will. Uh, synthetic finishes that are really impervious to rust and you know back when I used to live in Ohio in the summer it was really hot and humid like in Arkansas so you could almost look at them yeah. and they would rust yeah. now I live in the Rockies on the western slope of the Rockies where the humidity levels in the height of the summer uh, you know a humid day is 20 percent humidity so guns don't rust yeah. for me anymore but um, what you know I know you've got some favorites what the sort of things that you assign as important well most of what you said, but I mean, to me, you know, re reliability is number one. If, if the gun doesn't work, if I can't trust it functioning every time, you know, I have, I have no use for it. Um, you know, after that, I'm, I'm with you. Got to have a good trigger. Got to have some decent sights on it. Uh, I know you're a big fan of the, the larger magwell. I would, personally, I would never trade the large magwell for the extended thumb safety. For me, that does me more good than the extended magwell, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, back when I, the year I won the, the CDP, Division and IDPA, I, I shot a gun without a extended magwell on it. I, that's never been a, a big deal for me on on the load there. I'm with you on the beaver tail. Um, it helps me more on the draw than it does the actual shooting. I don't I don't have real meaty hands, so mm -hmm. I've never had a problem with a gun biting me. But I get a often yeah, I would grab I would grip. grab the top of the the grip safety and the hammer you know on the draw stroke. So I really like a beaver tail to enhance my ability to draw fast. But uh, like I say it. Well, one of the reasons I like the Magwell is I live in a part of the world where you have to wear gloves. Mm. And with gloves, sometimes it's a little difficult to hit the Magwell on a reload. But you're 100% right. I tell people, if you've got a pistol that's not reliable, get it fixed. If it's not reliable, if you can't get it fixed, then get rid of it and get one yeah. that works. Um, again, carrying a gun to say, gee, I don't know whether, I'm not sure whether it's going to work or not is a bad yeah. thing. So. Well, we both we both seen these guys, you know, come to classes, and and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure, you know, you've seen them even with your local group shooting group, that just, you know, every time you see them, they're having they're having gun problems, and it's like, you know, why don't you get that fixed? And it's like, 
they, it's like they're, they're okay with carrying a gun that doesn't work every time. And I, uh, I don't, for, for me, I can't, I can't understand that. No, that, that really spooks me. I, yeah. I tell people, if it doesn't work and I can't get it fixed, I'm not going to own it. Yeah. It goes yeah. away. Yeah. I mean, even one ex unexplained malfunction in, in, a, in a handgun, you know, makes me suspect of it. I mean, if, no. if I can't determine it's for sure, I've got bent feed lips, it, you know, there's, there's a ba bad round of ammo or I've just been really, really lazy and the gun's dirty and dry. You know, I mean, if it's, if it's you know, probably lubed and cleaned and good, good ammo and good magazines and I have a malfunction. I mean, and you, may, you just made a good point. There was a time, if you were a 1911 guy, your choice of the magazines were pretty limited. You either had a GI mag or a Colt magazine. And we spent a lot of time and money trying to modify them and make them work reliably. Really, the issue of the magazine and reliability, that equation has been somewhat limited, mainly because of all the work and effort you and your guys have put into the Wilson Combat magazine. So we now, today, tend to take the magazines for granted. Yeah. We don't remember back in the day when one of the most suspect things in how the pistol worked, 1911 pistol function, was the magazine. Now we don't even, you know, I, I see most 1911 stoppages when I see them are more often quite it's either operator error the guy's yeah. doing something wrong right, the gun's right, not right the slide or, or yeah. it's ammunition and the problem with the 1911 as we know people go out and buy say like 45 ammo on the market and that 230 grain hardball that o guy shape of the bullet is not military spec. military spec and it doesn't feed properly mm -hmm. and they go well this thing doesn't work well you're right you're not feeding the right ammo to it but i'm feeding it hardball that, that yeah, i know you're not you're feeling i love it a guy goes out and buys a nice expensive gun and what's he do he goes to some el cheapo gun show or whatever and buys a bunch of wolf 45 ball ammo which is oh, it's a terrible feeding ammo mm -hmm. in a 1911 and they, they or they go to the gun show and they or whatever and they buy a bunch of reloads XYZ reloads, and they got a good deal. And they come out to the class or load, and the gun doesn't work, and they're like, "Oh, my, this gun doesn't work." You go, "Where'd you get the ammo?" Mm. You know, there are some people that should not be allowed to reload. We all, we've yeah. met a lot mm -hmm. of them, right? Oh, yeah. So, feed it good ammo, keep it lubed. And the great thing about a company like Wilson Combat is, if you got a problem, they'll take care of it. Yeah, and I we, tell people, you guys stand behind your product. You know, don't home gunsmith your gun. Let the guys that know what they're doing at Wilson Combat. You know contact them they'll make sure that gun gets back and gets fixed and as, as made right uh, and i tell people nobody i mean you can buy a rolls royce and have a problem there's nothing that's perfect that's man-made but i've seen over the years your track record of guns being working well and, and your your issues have really shrunk so a problem with one of your guns is a pretty rare thing